Hi all and welcome to Urban Art 2021. This year the theme is on urban imaginaries and uh, the first panel of uh, this year's uh, Urban Art will be on narratives on the environment. We have uh, five papers today. Uh, the, the first paper will be by Ernesto Valero Thomas on the ecological imagination of emerging cities in the 21st century. Uh, after that, we'll have Shruti Raghavan from National Institute of Advanced Studies and the University of Transdisciplinary Health Sciences and Technology. Her paper is titled Contested Imaginations and Negotiating with the Cityscape, a case study of bovines in Delhi. Uh, the third paper is titled Reimagining Peripheral Geographies, a Dual Lens Approach to Examine Peri-Urban Dynamics in India. Uh, Lakshmi Rajendran from Anglia Ruskin University, Christopher Maitman, Reading University, and Shiba Chandar from Hindustan Institute of Science and Technology will be presenting this. Uh, after that, we have Raina Ghosh from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Her paper is titled Ghats and Everyday Hydrosocial Relations, Production of Urban Spaces Along Kolkata's Riverfront. And uh, finally, we have Debrun Sarkar from University of Mumbai. Uh, his paper is titled of Environment and Environmental Practices in New Town, West Bengal. We have uh, 15 minutes for presentation and about five minutes for Q&A. Regarding the questions, please post them to the Q&A box or Facebook and so on. And I will read aloud the questions uh, so that the panelists can respond. Now, I'd like to invite Ernesto to please start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you see the slides? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ernesto Valero Thomas. I am talking to you from Mexico City. The title of my presentation is The Ecological Imagination of Emerging Cities in the 21st Century. I would like you to, to take a look to this image. I will finish also with this uh, picture. And, but so far, I would like you to focus on, on the characteristics of the image. It is uh, like the representation of water, biodiversity, and also the uh, legacy of ancient cultures, uh, the pre-Hispanic cultures of uh, Mexico City. So please keep an eye on this. We, I will talk about uh, four topics, our ecological depth, our ecological anxiety and what I call the storytelling deficit in urban studies. I will explain briefly the method that I use in my, in my research, which, is, uh, which considers ecology, hermeneutics and architecture. Finally, the, uh, I will review my speculations and conclusions. We have a serious ecological debt uh, the organization Global Footprint Network has done a, a great work on, on analyzing uh, our footprint on, on Earth since the 60s. Uh, they have uh, coined terms such as ecological footprint, biocapacity, ecological deficit, ecological reserve. And we can see here clearly how uh, from the uh, uh, I mean, at the beginning of the 1970s, our footprint has uh, sharply increased. We understand that we live in a fragile world. Uh, we are consuming more water, food, energy than our lands and bodies of water can, can resist. Uh, India, China, Mexico, United States, all over Europe, we have a, a uh, um, a very difficult situation in terms of, of ecological deficit, footprint deficit. Perhaps uh, we will review uh, the situation of uh, some countries. Uh, in my opinion, this is the, the most important number that we should focus on, the ecological footprint per person, which is measured in terms of uh, global hectares per person. So let's take a look, United States, 8.1 uh, global hectares per person. South Korea, six global hectares. 
Germany, a country that has a very conscious society in terms of uh, global warming and ecological footprint, still they are in a very delicate situation, 4.9 global hectares per person. The Netherlands, similar. Japan it has a, a similar situation, 4.5 global hectares per person. China, after the year 2000, it has increased a lot its consumption. Mexico, where I am from, after 1975, we have seen a very stable uh, increase of its uh, ecological footprint per person. Vietnam, finally India, the ecological footprint per person is uh, smaller than European countries or USA or South Korea, but still, it is still high. So perhaps some of you already have seen this image. It was kind of uh, famous when it was published a couple of years ago. It is the computation of the temp global temperatures in hundreds of cities around the world and all over the continents. And it is clear that the temperatures, the temp the temperatures are rising everywhere. So the great Gregory Bateson in the book Steps of an Ecology of Mind, he, he was published in 1972. He already mentioned that the creature that wins against its environment destroys itself. And this diagram is in this book. And in, in cybernetics, this diagram is called uh, uh, positive feedback. Positive, not in terms of something good, but positive feedback in terms of a machinery that feeds itself like a clock or like a machine that uh, when one of its elements grows, the other will grow as well. And there are three elements, population, hubris, this idea that we can control the whole universe humans can control everything and that we are the, the masters of our fate. Also technology, the blind approach of, uh, to using technology for, for, to solve every problem that we have. But there are consequences, war, pollution, famine. So I, I would like you to, to think uh, about, uh, about this diagram and about uh, the, the year when it was published early 70s. What about now? Before the coronavirus uh, pandemic, the, the health emergency, all over the place, th there was this uh, concept of uh, eco-anxiety. It was over the play all over the place, in uh, the media, TV, publications. We also had even even in, in two years ago, this uh, uh, people who, who, especially young people, who were like uh, telling us how alarming the situation is. I believe that we know Greta Thunberg and her her call for for listen to scientists. This was before the coronavirus uh, emergency situation. I consider that we also have an institutional anxiety. Uh, we can see here a, a, a big number of institutions that are dealing with uh, the climate emergency or even the, the urban uh, situation in, in hundreds of uh, cities and countries all over the world. And the number is growing. We have dozens, even hundreds of institutions that are trying to deal with this issue. We know that we, the, the, the Earth hosts around 
4,300 cities with populations of uh, 100,000 people or more. We understand that all of these institutions, they have developed the data science and technologies in order to, to decrease our consumption or even decrease the ecological footprint in, in our uh, villages and cities. But to be honest, we really, we don't have a, a blueprint of what it will take to position them at scale. So here we are with a situation of uh, eco-anxiety, lack of common language or support network, eco-debt, lack of future, lack of balance, and eco -scale, lack of eco-scale, like lack of, lack of integration, lack of implementation of these solutions. This is our situation. The text being interlocal, published by Suketu Mehta, He's, he was born in India, now he's a journalist in the United States. Uh, opened my eyes uh, in order to, to develop this ecological narrative that I would like to, to continue over the years. And we can see here that uh, he mentions that the conversation around urbanism is like the Latin mass, uh, while professional storytellers uh, sail their sugar dreams of swimming pool and towers in the park to an uninformed pop populace. We know that when it comes to urban planners, our dreams could become the nightmares of the population. This was very important and I connect this to to some pictures that I took back in 2013 when I visited Bangalore. This idea of New York living in Bangalore. These are sugared dreams of contemporary urbanism. This idea of an island where you can stay in the sky and play in blue waters. It, it is sugared dreams of contemporary urbanism. Not, on, not only in India, but also in Brazil. So this is Mexico, where I am from. And this, is the, this was the ecological imagination of cities or countries in the 20th century, where you have the consolidated uh, human settlements, well, consolidated uh, national states. But this is not enough anymore for the ecological imagination of the 21st century where we have a complexity that deals with energy, culture, the body, architecture, mind, politics. So how can we construct a, an ecological imagination of cities in the 21st century? What I have done is to to structure this idea of three elements, ecology, hermeneutics, and architecture, in order to create a narrative of, of cities, in order to, to fight against this storytelling deficit that I mentioned before. I, I focus on topics, on concepts such as non-anthropocentric units, for instance, rivers, rocks, rice, anthropocentric units, which are uh, environments that serve humans, and technocentric uh, units. These are like technologies or, or infrastructures that, uh, that deal with these non-anthropocentric units. I deal with geography, with infra infrastructures, eco-utopias, eco-dystopias, and the possibility of creating maps as a way of reading the city. So my speculations about the creation of uh, these narratives on urban environments is that uh, architecture that architecture deals with the flows of food, fuels, electricity, water, and waste. We need to construct storytelling instruments we need to craft hybrid 
multi-dimensional maps. These are life support systems. They are hybrid units that mediate between machines, humans, and non-human or organisms. Here are examples of these spaces where I believe architects, urban planners, in the academy that we can create a, a narrative around them, around not only the scale, but the networks of these infrastructures. The, uh, here we see petrol stations, water tanks, management of waste, uh, reservoir, leisure in the outskirts of cities, the flow of food in silos or in markets, flow of food in the suburbs of the cities. And I have one minute to conclude. So this is my conclusion. This is Mexico City. It, it, it hosts around 20 million people. It used to, perhaps you know, but this used to be the, the, the home of the Aztec civilization. It was, uh, it is a valley, but before it was surrounded by canals and, and lake and a lake bed. After the Spanish conquest, uh, water was eradicated from, from the surface of the city. If you come to Mexico City, you will not see rivers or any kind of uh, bodies of water. Here, these are represent digital representations, right? We still have the, the rivers, uh, well, I only have a few seconds. So we have the rivers coming down from the hills. And I will conclude with this. This is an urban uh, well. Actually, it is called Gandhi, as you can see here. It is in Spanish the Gandhi well. And we see the representations of nature, water, ecosystems. Also, Suketu Meta asks in his text, who is singing the song of the city and who is listening? These representations consider the, the nature, the original nature of the valley which is like a place surrounded by water. This is the god Tlaloc in the ancient Aztec civilization. He was in charge of, of uh, the rain. So for me, all these infrastructures are opportunity to go beyond uh, beautiful pictures or beautiful narratives uh, on urban ecology these places they are really telling they, they are really telling us a lot of stories and a lot of uh, they are giving us a lot of elements to to work with and to create uh, more sustainable cities thank you very much thank you Ernesto. uh we'll wait for some of the questions to come up in a chat box Meanwhile, um, I was just wondering, you know, you showed some of the images, especially towards the end. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what was the kind of, how do, how do, you know, people in the city, residents of the city relate to some of these things? Any, any sense about that? Well, about the in, uh, urban infrastructures that I showed, right? Well, of course, uh, it depends on the city, but there is this pattern that no matter where you go, no matter where you city, uh, uh, no matter uh, like the country or the context, you will always have these flows, water, food, um, el uh, electric mobility or, or motor-based uh, mobility. And the infrastructure could, could change. You could have huge uh, petrol stations, uh, as you can see in the United States, or you could have a small uh, uh, ports where you can plug your, your electric uh, vehicle. The thing is that these elements are creating different uh, networks, 
different uh, patterns. And when you study those patterns, you could see a lot of uh, interaction, perhaps interaction that we are not conscious about, but that could give you a hint about mobility, consumption, uh, social uh, aspects of the city. And eventually, once it is mapped by a, by a multi-dimensional way, perhaps you can you can have more elements to to create more sustainable cities. That's that's the point. So we have some questions in the chat box. So uh, first up is interesting presentation. Thanks. Can you please expand a bit on uh, what the court read as dream of urban planners can become nightmares? Is it more in the context of lack of common language between practice, research, and policy? Definitely, definitely. Uh, of course, I mean, when we say languages, it could be as, as simple as saying, okay, we only speak uh, big languages like English, Spanish, official languages, right? And not the local languages. That's one point. But also what kind of uh, visual languages we use, what kind of metaphors, what kind of uh, terminology we use. And it is not only about like making it simple for everyone to understand, but to to grasp it in a, in a way that our solutions or our proposals are, are, are adapted into, into this context. As I said, the, the infrastructures they will not change or they will change just a little bit they will they will be there but the way that people interact with them is 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 the key issue how to how to understand that thank you Ernesto I think we are out of time there uh, we'll have to move on to the second presentation uh, I invite uh, Shruti, Shruti Raghavan from National Institute of Advanced Studies I hope you can all see the screen. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Shruti Raghavan, a PhD scholar with the Urban Ecologies Project from the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank IIHS for organizing this conference and to the research team in particular for fielding all my emails and queries. Um, so the title of my presentation is Contested Imaginations and Negotiating with the Cityscape, a case study of bovines in Delhi. Urban life brings about a paradigm shift in social, economic, cultural, and ecological spaces. As evasive spaces where life flourishes at the interface of precarity, metabolism, and materiality, who or what constitutes the urban becomes a critical question to examine. As spaces primarily meant for the habitation of certain classes of humans, the presence of non-humans is restricted is restricted to pets, zoo animals, rodents, and some stray animals. Parallel to this, much of urban studies literature focuses on the human in an urban space or city and does not consider other possible non-human actors uh, in an urban space or uh, in an urban space. So with this in mind, uh, this paper attempts to approach the city of Delhi from the more than human, specifically by centering bovine bodies, movements, and lives in the imagination of the city. Why bovines, one may ask? As most of us might be aware, the issue of stray cattle is quite a prominent phenomenon in the capital city. Now, while the presence of contemporary capital can be observed on footpaths, roads, traffic signal islands, um, sorry, uh, bovine tracks and traces can also be found in state archives, uh, city plans, and documents. So the question I therefore begin with is what has the historical position of bovines been in the shaping of this city, and what are the anthropocentric logics which underlie its formulation? In that sense, centering bovines is not merely to make visible the non-human in colonial and post-colonial historiography, but it is, it is an attempt to rethink the urban form as a more than human landscape. I begin by first looking at the infrastructural imagination of the city at the level of the state and the local. 
predominantly composed of villages and agricultural land, Delhi was inhabited by farmers and cattle rearers among other communities. Pastoral communities such as the Ahirs of Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan and the Gujars of Haryana have, for instance, migrated and settled in and around the walled city of Shah Jahanabad for more than a century, bringing with them their herds of cows, buffaloes, goats and sheep. In response to the growing presence of non-human lives in the city, since the late 19th century, one can trace the emergence of cattle being constituted as a nuisance in juridical legal records of the city, which largely stems from a colonial obsession with sanitation. While it took the form of disease control measures, health statistics and regulations with human populations, it also produced a set of laws, regulations and measures for non-humans. For instance, in 1871, the Cattle Trespass Act came into effect. Here, cattle referred not only to cows, calves, and buffaloes, but to other animals, including elephants, camels, pigs, and horses. So any cattle which trespassed into cultivated land or damaged public property, such as roads, canals, embankments, were to be impounded in village cattle pounds. The primary aim being to contain animals thought to be of a nuisance to the city in defined and segregated spaces. From the 1890s, however, there is more emphasis given particularly to bovines because of their straying habits. Dairy men, for instance, were taxed for keeping milch cattle within the walled city. And this tax, uh, the belief was that such a tax would basically drive away the ghosies to either the suburbs or the outskirts, restoring sanitary standards within the walled city. Now, the logic of sanitation and maintaining hygienic standards of Delhi increased more so once the capital shifted from Calcutta to Delhi in 1911. Like most cities of the world, Delhi too has been planned, envisioned and designed with certain underlying logics. New Delhi particularly was envisioned and landscaped to represent the imagination of an imperial capital. British landscaping techniques are uh, you know, characteristic of being designed, controlled, shaped and artificial even. This can be observed in the design and formation of New Delhi, where the city was imagined as branching out of a central axis or vista into hexagonal shaped streets, uniform grids and rows. Now, while New Delhi was specifically designed for colonial bungalows, for uh, buildings and for the parliament complex, this design aspect or spatial ordering was also extended to unplanned and unmanicured landscapes such as agricultural and grazing lands. However, it is not only such lands um, which do not fit into this imaginary of a capital city, but other spaces and bodies as well. So spaces including ghettos, slums, underdeveloped areas, as well as bodies such as that of the poor, the migrants, the disabled and non-human animals have been relegated to the city's margins, peripheries to being othered or ghettoized. So in the case of bovines, for instance, uh, from the 1912 to the 30s, uh, a large number of cattle pounds were set up in villages across Delhi based on complaints either raised by zamindars because of crop damage, as well as to prevent cattle from being a nuisance to traffic and to the general public. And in the 1940s, one of the major concerns was Delhi, uh, along with an increasing population, was the need to supply milk. Uh, sourcing milk not from the Gaowalas, because again, issues of hygiene, mixing of different milks of adulteration and so on, but by formalizing milk production, which would ensure quality milk. So if you look at the many iterations of this Delhi milk scheme, what was characteristic of these proposals was its dual nature, wherein the scheme called for ensuring uh, the supply of pure milk, but at the same time to also relocate these bovines and the dairy farmers to defined animal spaces of a cattle colony. So the removal of these informal means of sourcing milk was strengthened with the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act of 1957, where it became illegal for cattle to be milked or tethered within the urban limits of post-colonial Delhi. Urban villages located on the fringes of the urban limits, of the then urban limits, were considered as viable spaces in the 1962 Master Plan of Delhi to relocate village trades or other obnoxious trades such as pottery, tanning, dairy farming, which were otherwise taking up valuable lands within the urban heart of the city. However, with the, uh, you know, with the spatial growth of the city, more urban villages and therefore bovines and dairy farmers came within the ambit of uh, urban limits. 
and in addition agricultural lands surrounding these villages were acquired by the delhi development authority dda resulting in the transformation of these lands into property be it residential commercial or into manicured landscapes a point i will come back to later as a result another pushing out regime of the dda was through the establishment of nine authorized dairy colonies as you can see in this map here on the outskirts of the city in the 1970s much to their dismay of course most farmers did not relocate because of poor infrastructural facilities and of course there was a difficulty in also transporting milk uh, from 40 kilometers away so this is also why one continues to find farmers and cattle within middle class settlements and neighborhoods in delhi so now returning to the notion of property for the urban middle class the social structuring of the neighborhood on based on aesthetics is closely entangled with the question of property according to hart and negri property is deeply embedded in the intertwining of power law and capital referred to as the republic of property and which to quote determine and dictate the conditions of possibility of social life in all its facets and phases close quote so the individual in this regard is defined not by being but by having therefore it is not only the possession of property which is crucial but the value which is associated with the land and the surrounding ecology which is dependent to a large scale on city infrastructures if we look at delhi for instance and over the last decade specifically um the value of neighborhoods and individual properties has been dependent on its proximity to the delhi metro whether the property is close to a grocery market or not most advertisements for flat sales and rentals do not fail to mention the distance to the nearest metro station in that sense it is with the coming of this large scale transport infrastructure that there has been a drastic shift in real estate values and any element or force therefore which has the potential to undermine this value is deemed to be removed from that space now in the early 2000s this took the form of legal activism and citizen campaigns amongst the middle class against stray cattle through an ngo called common cause in delhi while it did not result in permanent measures it led to the emergence of a discourse of public interest and citizenship where civic and environmental issues were foregrounded so this aspiration for the middle class for an ordered for an hygienic environmentally and ecologically conscious neighborhood uh, is what uh, bhaviskar calls bourgeois environmentalism so the members of this organization as bhaviskar says typically consist of upper class and upper caste families former bureaucrats and so on for whom roadside uh, you know for whom green spaces refer to manicured spaces parks uh, designed recreational spaces and for whom the roadside garbage dump on the other hand is not merely uh, considered an eyesore rather i argue that this is a larger sensorial politics at play here wherein only certain smells and sights are considered acceptable within the urban going by this smells which result in affective feelings of disgust are situated towards the margins and peripheries of the city this can be observed in this one area in east delhi called, Gha called ghazipur where you have the city slaughterhouse you have uh, you know you have the landfill you have livestock markets you have a dairy colony all towards the border so such an imagination not only expects infrastructures but the people and the non humans associated with these infrastructures to be out there and at the level of the neighborhood uh, the sight of cattle and the smell of cattle dung and urine for instance is considered as a matter out of place so this othering of bodies smells of sights and spaces finds its basis in the exclusionary logic of the state and is implemented through a series of governmental juridical and policing apparatuses at both the level of the state and the local bringing with it a violence which is meted out through improvement and sanitary logics of spatial separation ordering displacement seizures relocation as well as through measures of neglect of a lack of basic services and infrastructures according to anthropologist carlin humphrey ideology finds its presence not only in texts and speeches but in material structures as well now while humphrey makes this argument based on early soviet state project of house commune buildings the point she essentially makes is that ideology and politics can be found not only in city plans and documents but is very much embedded in the construction of built forms and city infrastructures 
in that sense one can argue that it is through infrastructures that the state's vision of the city is transformed from a rationality to a practice resulting in the distribution of resources creation of networks and flows as well as in the segregation of spaces bodies and relations thereby ensuing an infrastructural imagination of the city infrastructures according to mrazek enable feelings of modernity and progressiveness through sensorial and political experiences and so in this larger imagination of what it means to be modern bovines are imagined by both the state and the urban middle class to exist only within animal spaces defined by the state which as far as we understand typically lie to the margins the question which remains of course is that despite these stringent policies and measures in place together with an influential middle class how do cattle and thereby dairy farmers subsist within the urban limits of the city in the case of majority of dairy farmers it is seen that they have been living in the same location within the city for more than 50 to 60 years there is an ecology that they are a part of and an ecology which they have created surrounding their dairy farming practices from where the cattle is housed the feed provided to whom they sell milk to uh, all taking place within a particular geography situated amidst busy and bustling residential and commercial spaces most dairy farmers in urban villages have makeshift cattle sheds either on footpaths some have converted the ground floor of their one set um, one room set buildings into sheds while others tether cattle to either uh, you know railings or electric poles on the side of the road now without grazing lands or open spaces either cattle when left astray walk rest forage ruminate on streets by lanes of the neighborhood sometimes in parks and at garbage dumps on the one hand this has cultivated certain practices between bovines and humans for instance many residents can be seen feeding bovines with leftovers or old or basi rotis and take her blessing an activity which largely stems from the religious sacredness of the cow however these are also the very same individuals who complain to the municipal corporation of delhi on grounds of cattle menace and in order to deal with such contradictions on an everyday basis there are certain negotiations that the dairy farmer needs to make for instance dairy farmers try to maintain cordial relations with the social and physical surrounding by ensuring that any dung on the road whether it belongs to their herd or not is cleaned from the streets in addition they also create informal networks um they also create informal networks with cattle catchers or lower level officials within the veterinary department who inform them in advance of cattle raids or inspections sometimes it also appears as if they are aiding officials during inspections despite this there are incidences of them having to give up one member of their herd as a bribe in order to protect the other members and at other instances uh you also have where their sheds have been broken by the uh, dairy farm uh, by the mcd both acts which typically occur when a new official heads the department to conclude so what one gathers from this is that while the cow is fed revered and considered sacred this symbolic value can be quickly replaced with notions of nuisance in matters of real estate and property values and of an imagined aesthetics of a neighborhood within the post colonial capital city thus while animals might otherwise uh, form a significant part of the everyday lives and ecology of the neighborhood in such scenarios bovines and dairy farmers no longer find themselves belonging to this landscape what ensues in the process is not merely a violence against certain bodies but also of an active invisibilization of bodies advocated um, by local and state machineries thereby contributing to the construction of animal spaces which finds its basis in the infrastructural imagination of the city thank you thank you shruti thank for that you. very interesting presentation um, we will wait Uh, for the questions to come up in the chat box meanwhile i thought you know that uh, the image of gazipur which you showed was especially evocative because you kind of brought together all of those things especially in the periphery of uh, the city and in fact i think there is also um, a lot of energy infrastructure also in the immediate vicinity of uh, that area uh, and you know it also connects back connecting back to uh, ernesto's uh, presentation uh, there's a question of you know the relationship 
of the imagination of the kind of relationship between the city and various uh, aspects of uh, the environment. In, in mm -hmm. one case, let's say the relationship between urban and water, the role that water plays in the case of whether it's Mexico City or cities here in India and so on. And in this case, the relationship between city and animals, in specifically cattle and so on. And uh, each of the in each of these cases, there really is a question of the imagination around various environment and ecological aspects and how that relates to the city. So we have a question here. I wonder how does that um, that is fascinating. I wonder how that works within a legal framework in case of accidents uh, of animals or vehicles. Has that changed over time? Um, if I'm Wait. understanding the question correctly. Um, yeah, I think it's about uh, uh, if, if there are accidents uh, with animals, okay. uh, well, how does that fit within the existing legal framework and has there been any changes over time? Um, I, um, as far as I know, at least in the current con context with the NCD, um, if you do find any injured cattle or in fact you do find, uh, you know, cattle which uh, either due to accident have either died or any such thing you do, uh, there is a specific wing within the veterinary department who you have to call up and they will come and collect the body of the cattle and they have a rendering plant again which is located in Ghazipur next to the slaughterhouse. Um, and this goes for uh, most animals as far as I know. I'm guessing also maybe the question is also about responsibility. Uh, are people who own the cattle in any way responsible within the current legal framework for any such accidents? I'm, I'm just guessing maybe that is something which... Okay. Um, I mean, that is an import... I mean, that is an interesting question and uh, uh, that's something I haven't looked at. So thank you for raising that. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, the expansion of roadways in Delhi, um, sorry, one minute, in to accommodate and hampering the life of cattle, metros, uh, metro is a recent development in the last decade, but can you detail the significance of roads with respect to cattle care and policies taken to protect the same? Sorry, where is this question? I would just like to read it again. Yeah, I mean, it's a... One second, let me just try to enlarge my own chat window so that I can see. I'm not sure I can send you the question. Okay, meanwhile, maybe we can move on to this question. How can legal and religious affiliation converge and uh, come up with a solution for stray cattle? Legal and? Okay. Religious affiliation converge and come up with a solution for stray cattle. Okay. Um, I mean, to be honest, if you think about it, there is already an affiliation. Uh, if you look at the current policies of um, the MCD and the way they function, um, on the one hand, you, they do, they, the, the matter at hand is that they do not want the presence of these non-humans within the urban. It is okay to ex for these bodies to exist outside the urban. And if they do find them, they uh, impound them in goshalas, which are again state-run, uh, state-funded, uh, you know, animal spaces. Um, so in that sense, this does come from a, uh, from this notion that um, cows, for instance. Um, you know, cannot be left astray uh, and typically find their way to goshalas. They also cannot be slaughtered. So I think in terms, if you look at it in terms of meat, uh, if you also look at it in terms, yeah, so if you look at it in terms of slaughtering policies as well, um, that sort of coincides with this whole protectionism that exists around, uh, you know, the lives of uh, cows specifically. And so you have the creation of these spaces which are typically designed only for cows, whereas buffaloes, on the other hand, do not find their way to pounds, but they will automatically be sent to slaughterhouses. Thank you. I think there are a few other questions, but unfortunately time is up. Maybe we can figure out how to share some of these questions and comments with you after the session is over. We'll have to move on to the third paper, Reimagining Peripheral Geographies, a dual lens approach to examine peri-urban dynamics in India. 
Lakshmi Rajendran, Christopher Maidman, and uh, Shiba Chandra will be presenting. Over to you. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, uh, yeah, for me, uh, Chris would be sharing the screen due to some technical glitch with my laptop. Um, 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 but before we, before I begin, there, there are four presenters. Arindam has finally joined. Um, so um, yeah, thanks I, I, IIHS for giving us this opportunity to present our paper. Um, so uh, this is going to be slightly challenging given the 15 minutes and we are going to be four presenters you know, presenting from different locations. So uh, we are just going, we didn't practice it. We are just going to go by flow. Hopefully you know, we will sync and um, you know, um, talk about our slides uh, in the right manner. Um, uh, I'm taking the liberty to uh, introduce the rest of my team, uh, considering the time limitations. So I'm Lakshmi Rajendran. I'm a senior research fellow at Anglia Ruskin University. Uh, Chris is a lecturer in planning in Reading University and Arundham, uh, uh, associate professor in IIT Roorkee. And um, uh, Shiba is professor and dean in uh, Hindustan Institute of Technology and Sciences. Um, the project um, I would like to acknowledge is funded by SHLC. Um, Center for Sustainable, Healthy, and Learning Cities and Neighborhoods uh, based in the University of Glasgow. Um, the topic of our presentation today is uh, Reimagining Urban Peripheries, a dual lens approach uh, to examine the peri-urban dynamics in India, which kind of uh, links with you know, both the presentations, you know, what we've just heard. Um, so can if we go to the uh, structure of presentation, uh, the first uh, slide, uh, uh, we would we would start with a very brief introduction mm. and research, and I'll get into the research context in which the whole presentation is being done, and uh, which will be followed by the planning and policy challenges in Peri have been uh, presented by Arundham. Um, Chris would be talking about um, what are the existing framings of the Peri urban and what are the problematics within that, um, followed by uh, Sheba who who would explain uh, about our case study, and then I would. Um, work, I would be talking about the preliminary analysis discussion and the conclusion of a presentation. Um, so moving on to uh, a, a general introduction to this presentation itself. Uh, so this is uh, this is based on our ongoing research project uh, funded by SSH, SHLC, which I, uh, which I mentioned. Um, so the, the project itself is titled as Connecting the Urban and the Peri-Urban, a Transformative Policy Framework for Inclusive and Resilient Urban Development in India. Um, so the context in which this whole project developed is, of course, you know, we all know cities in the developing countries specifically expand more rapidly um, than can be sustained by infrastructure and services, well explained in both the early presentations. So this obviously causes severe social, economic and economic um, environmental disparities. Um, and it, it does lead to quite a lot of marginalized uh, marginalized communities uh, deteriorating environment, health, and quality of living, particularly in the peri-urban areas, which essentially occurs at the urban and the rural interface. So our project um, uh, investigates what are the challenges and the potentials of integrating these urban and the peri-urban areas, um, looking in Chennai city as a case study, um, in a way to promote uh, urban resilience and health and well-being. Um, our aim is to develop a pl new planning and policy framework. While it sounds ambitious, we are trying to develop a very conceptual framework in, uh, uh, within our project, um, which would actually help, uh, which will actually have um, develop a strategic urban and the peri-urban interface to promote resilience and inclusiveness in Indian cities. Um, so uh, if, uh, we all know that you know, there's, there's a dramatic increase in the concentration of poverty and environmental degradation in peri-urban zones you know, due to various factors. And uh, studies do say that you know, it, it is within the peri-urban area, there's quite a lot of prevalence of the shocks and stresses which are caused uh, as, as, an, as an impact of the urbanization and the urban sprawl, sprawl which is occurring. And definitely there is a need for a, 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 a revisioning of planning and policy framework, which would actually enable resilience and integrated city development considering peri-urban as a key frontier of sustainable development. Um, moving on to the research context, uh, as as you know, as we have seen in all the images which are showed even in the previous presentation, and you know the images which I am showing, uh, peri-urban has definitely has both the urban and the rural characteristics, and uh, people in the peri-urban areas are engaged in agriculture-related work, you know, industry-related work, and um, peri-urban areas house the native residents, migrant settlers, and employers of the particular industry which are located in those in those areas, 
and there is an emerging trend of increasing high-end gated communities as well, you know, which, which, which caters to elite, middle and high-income communities, uh, giving a, a different kind of an urban fabric to the entire peri-urban geographies. And um, there's quite a lot of migrant settlers, who, uh, including the poor people immigrating from other parts of the states towards the towns and cities who also inhabit these areas. So there's quite a lot of challenges um, which the peri-urban areas face due to increase in density of population buildings and of, uh, the resultant um, increase of stress in the infrastructure and uh, un uncontrolled growth of new settlements, sometimes you know, in, in, in hazardous locate, locations. Um, one other major uh, challenge is the changing land use itself. You know, once residential areas are converted into commercial industrial areas and you know, industrial areas, uh, agriculture areas are converted into you know, industrial and commercial zones. So that there's, a, there's a very dynamic and um, at, at most of the times very problematic kind of land use uh, change uh, we could see in the peri-urban areas. Um, Moving on to the next slide. Uh, so some of the challenges faced due to these are of the main thing with, you know, in the context of India, which is, a, uh, which is largely a farming nation, you know, a disappearance of food grain and vegetable produce. Uh, there's rise in price of commodities and land, and there's quite a lot of social, political, and economic uh, challenge of forced land acquisition caused by land mafia. And there's a shrinking open space and Consequent degradation of peri-urban environments. Um, you know, one other, uh, one other major um, uh, challenge is the lack of social infrastructure, like medical facilities and education facilities. May, uh, when I say lack of you no know, social infrastructure, it, it, um, in most of the cases, it is also about the accessibility of these uh, infrastructure, which is an issue which links to the lack of transportation facilities, creating inequalities in terms of access to infrastructure, so infrastructures and amenities. Um, and due to all this, there's quite a lot of marginalization happening you know, in these peripheral geographies of vulnerable communities who, who only keep moving far, more, for, move far and far away from the locations. Um, and there's, there's quite a, this social anonymity res resulting in increased crime rates is also another um, important issue which, um, uh, which the peri area faces. Um, so there's clearly a lack of planning and policy attention in the peri areas in India. And uh, yeah, the, the, the next couple of slides will touch upon you know, what are the existing plans and policies and what are the issues within the planning and the policies. So if I can request Arindam to take over the next few slides. Uh, thank, thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, as Lakshmi uh, pointed out uh, in the introduction, uh, introductory uh, section about how uh, or what are the challenges of peri urbanization, uh, here I am looking at uh, more specific, uh, since this research is about uh, Indian city and we are uh, researching uh, in Chennai, uh, the major planning and policy challenges that we find in our urban area is uh, is largely uh, which is being addressed after this 2005 uh, 2005 uh, Jalal Nehru urban renewal mission and which actually created a little of a kind of an ambiguity uh, between uh, the so-called urban and rural in terms of this administrative jurisdiction uh, and then addressing those administrative jurisdiction and addressing properly like who, who will do what kinds of a situation at the peri-urban area in, in real terms. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Yeah, and uh, we also have a kind of an, uh, kind of observed of, about the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act, which is already being very old and uh, which also have not properly implemented. And even the uh, fiscal uh, decentralization that, uh, that uh, comes with the act and also the, uh, the suggestions of uh, the 14 finance commissions, uh, but hardly any state have actually gone ahead and uh, created those kinds of fiscal decentralization to the local government, which also created a lot of problem for uh, addressing infrastructure issues uh, in the peri-urban areas. And most of the implementation of uh, policies and strategies that we find in most of our peri-urban area, including Chennai, uh, is about water and sanitation <clears throat> that makes a major challenge because the, the, the development is so segregated uh, and so well uh, spread across, it's very difficult to have a kind of a, a proper 
uh, a proper addressing of uh, water and sanitation issues in the in the peri urban area that we see all over the uh, all over the country almost and we have also uh, reviewed uh, a hubli dharwa region in karnataka to identify uh, that situation where uh, there are kind of a, a dichotomy or confusion between an stp uh, and uh, it was not sure that uh, who will uh, who would board the, the expenditure and also who would be benefited out of those infrastructure uh, out of it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so another, which is a very common uh, phenomenon that we uh, observe all, probably all over the world is about that uh, land use conversion, uh, which is also uh, evident in our cases. Uh, and also uh, sometimes uh, the, the identifying the appropriate uh, owner of, of a land and also paying compensation once the land is acquired or land is being used for some kinds of business transactions uh, also make challenge for both the government and also for the bureaucrat to identify the actual ownership of the land and then uh, get benefited out of those uh, land transactions. Uh, next, I, I would like uh, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, Chris, if you can. Thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, so my um, part of the presentation is just trying to think about how this comes together in the way that the peri-urban has been framed. Um, and what I think you'll see from what Lakshmi and Narindam have said um, is this very dominant framing of peri-urban areas as in-between spaces. Um, this idea that they're at the interface between urban and rural zones, um, but tending to see them as spaces that are going to transition into the urban. You know, we talk about these as peri-urban spaces around the urban, as opposed to peri-rural spaces, for example. Um, and so there is this kind of assumption that is, has become very strongly embedded and institutionalized that these spaces will transition into being a urban area, so very much in the kind of framing of them as spaces that the urban can spread out into. Um, and what we also have is a tendency for most existing research to therefore look at these as spaces of flows. Um, so spaces of flows of goods, people, knowledge and capital um, through these spaces. Um, and, and, and particularly obviously around that, that idea of transition as well and flow, flows in that way. Um, but within all this is perhaps a, a limited analysis of peri-urban process in any great depth. And I suppose where our, our project aims to be different in the way that is framing peri-urban areas is to instead try and bring in um, much more about the, the sort of everyday life and lived experience of these places, um, which is what we're arguing is, is not taken into account by the way peri-urban areas have been framed to date. And so that kind of leads us on to our kind of um, theoretical approach, um, which is to so first of all, acknowledge that we do need to consider these flow-based conceptualizations. Um, it would be naive to not expect these areas to evolve at all. Um, and so, there, yeah, so we do need to take that into account and we do need to understand those processes and how they are shaping these areas to date. Um, but what we want to insert into this is a much greater understanding of lived experience and the distinctiveness of these areas, the networks within these areas, and actually how those understandings might shape these flows towards more resilient, more sustainable outcomes in the future. And at this point, I hand on to Sheba, who's going to say a little bit about our case study. Yeah, as far as the case study is concerned, we have selected Chennai metropolitan area as our case study area. As some of you know, Chennai is the capital of Tamil Nadu, and it is one of the four metropolis and fifth most populated city in India. Chennai metropolitan area includes 1189 square kilometer, encompassing of Chennai city, eight municipalities, 11 town panjayats, 10 panjayat unions comprising of 179 village panjayats, which is part of Piruva Lower and Kanjipuram district. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, there's a map left side shows these uh, administrative units of Chennai. 
and the map right side shows the delimited area of our uh, study that is out of the 10 panchayat unions we have delimited our study area into st thomas mount panchayat union which consists of 15 villages in, which is in southern part of chennai city please next slide please and this map shows the 15 villages, location of 15 villages in St. Thomas of Mount Panjaya Union. Next slide, please. Yeah, as far as the data collection is concerned, secondary data we are almost done with. And two focus group uh, with the stakeholders are over and the participatory ma mapping is under progress. And for primary, uh, sir, primary data collection, we are going ahead with the semi-structured questionnaire for the interview with the beneficiaries. And another quantitative methods like GIS mapping is under progress. And we are coming up with the key objectives to understand the perception of peri-urban areas from the point of view of stakeholders. And we'll be examining the potentials and opportunities of peri-urban areas, which will help us to come out with policies and proposals which will make peri-urban areas sustainable, thereby increasing the quality of life. I'll hand over to Lakshmi now at this point. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll quickly, you know, conclude uh, this. This is this, this is the final slide, anyway. Um, so some of the we, we've done these, you know, focus groups, and you no, know, we've done these, you know, some of the mapping exercises with the part with the resident participants. So what we what we want to try to tell here is there's this flow-based conception and there's this place-based conception, and it it kind of brings in different kind of narratives of what periurban is. So uh, while the while the development and all those aspects could be captured in the flow conception, there is there is quite a lot of emerging themes which 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 talks about the sense of everyday temporal belongings and mem memories within the place and how uh, legibility of the periurban areas is being achieved through you no know, walking on an everyday basis in the nearby uh, you know walking to the amenities and other infrastructure facilities and there there was also quite a strong emerging theme on the multi sensorial experiences these places bring about. So these flow and place concept, you no know, kind of creates impacts and influences each other, and they, they, it has a quite a strong implication on how the urban and the rural conflicts are impacting both pl place perception and experience. Uh, Chris, next slide, which. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm just jumping onto the slide which kind of captures the framework what we are trying to approach, you know, which we are trying to free, um, develop for this research. So these two frameworks, when looked in, in simultaneously, kind of helps us to understand the peri-urban dynamics where the economic practices, social institutions, and the values and uh, uh, environmental values and practices are interacting. So this framework would kind of aid us in understanding planning for urban processes rather than specific regions. So the processors embed both social, spatial, and environmental narratives you know, within the peri-urban areas. So yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah. This this is how we would want to conclude. Um, you know, a, a dual lens approach would help us to plan for the urban processes rather than the peripheries. Yeah. Next. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we have just about a couple of minutes for some questions. Um, I'm assuming the questions are going to come up in the chat box soon. Um, yeah, while that is coming up, maybe there's room for just a short uh, comment. Uh, so uh, I was curious to know, you know, any thoughts on, um, you know, people in some of these peri-urban areas and how imaginations around settlement environment relationships, because yeah, you know, we've been talking about that in the previous uh, presentations also. Yeah, unfortunately, that was something which I wanted to expand in the in the last but the last slide. Yes, um, so the, what would be understood from you no? Know, we did quite a lot of mapping exercises and semi-structured interviews with the resident participants, and there's there's a quite a lot of uh, uh, difference in perceptions. Like when we say peri-urban, we always think that you no know, people of poor no poorer communities, poor background, or uh, not not the elite middle income who, who actually come in there. But th th there's a kind of a different narrative where um, even the high elite uh, communities who live in there, they, they, they think it gives a great advantage of both the rural and the urban setting. Um, and there's another set of narratives where you no know, people who don't belong to the elite group, uh, you know, who are from the lower middle income group kind of defend their position saying that no it's it, it only the people who are in the urban core they're very kind of snobbish about you know about their environment but actually here we do have the multiplexes which are coming up which for which we don't have to you know travel so far again to you know the city core so uh there, there's there's a quite a lot of conflict even in terms of how people perceive 
but uh, one element which we can clearly see is missing is no the periyaba needs to be understood as a place where people in that bit where they create a sense of belonging you no know, identity and it, it's not just a place of transition uh, yeah i'll quickly read out maybe two questions yeah. which have come up we have a little bit of time to respond to that uh, one is uh, uh, can place based conception of periyaba areas be strengthened by focusing on changing livelihoods and uh, you know which brings up society environment links and could you expand a little bit on how livelihoods are changing in, in these areas and one more question is uh, how does you know the post covid scenario change any of these uh, conceptions uh, uh, okay um, so there's quite a lot in it to answer but you no know, one main thing what i want to address here is um, this is exactly what we want to do with our project uh, i think the whole perception of the periyaba needs to be changed to actually bring in about a change a, to look at what periyaban is how the periyaban development needs to be you no know, uh, understood by planners or policy makers or residents so in terms of how the livelihoods are changing uh, you no know, if you look at some of the periyaban regions uh, in chennai the case study places you have you no know, uh, very elite gated communities which have come up and there are you no know, um, quite a lot of um, very good private universities which are there you no know, and it and there are it industries um so in terms of the fabric which is there it it definitely it 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 is definitely in par with what is happening in the cities uh so we cannot say periyaban is a poor region but we should definitely say there's quite a lot of inequalities in terms of you no know, both the rich and the poor you no know, kind of coexist there but um unfortunately the issues addressed are more related to the rich rather than the poor you no know? so that that is what is the kind of uh, dichotomy which is existing um yeah if i have uh, answered thank yeah. you i think we are out of time we'll have to move yeah. on to the next paper uh, yeah i i would like to thank my entire team because we never thought we would pull it up in 15 or <laughs> 17 minutes so thank you so much everyone i think given the restrictions and limitations you did a great job thank you <laughs> thank all of you thank thank you uh, i invite uh, raina ghosh yeah. from jawaharlal nehru university to now present a paper titled ghats and everyday hydro social relations production of urban spaces along kolkata's river front Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, IIHS, for giving me this opportunity to present my work. So I'm Raina Ghosh, currently uh, doing my PhD at the Center for the Study of Regional Development in JNU, and this particular paper is actually part of my PhD, large uh, PhD work that I'm doing. And I just started off with my field work in between the pandemic started, so it's more of a preliminary understanding of the field. But it, uh, I mean, I got very interesting insights in terms of the contentions around the imaginaries in the in, in this urban context. so uh, when we talk about like river fronts that is something that has been already studied extensively in the urban literature but when we talk about ghats and which basically means uh, the flight of steps which lead down to the river it has got very different vernacular meanings and a space that is quite significantly different from the river front that we kind of think about so i use a different epistemological lens which is that of the hydro social relations to study these spaces and kind of take forward the argument of the peripheral spaces and how the dynamics within them play out so uh yeah so uh before moving on to my work i kind of uh, quickly glanced through recent policy advancements that have taken place uh, at, at the national level and which kind of uh, hold importance in terms of changing the way we look into rivers and the spaces adjoining them for example in 2016 this national waterways act was passed in order to uh, and it kind of notified 111 waterways of the country for an inland waterways transport program similar counterpart of this uh, of it was kind of uh, presented by the west bengal government also called the jaldhara program and out of this 111 waterways the national waterways one was actually denoted for the jal marg vikas program so basically it uh, intended to boost the uh, the freight movement in the eastern transport corridor which is one of the very significant corridors of the country then we also had the earth ganga scheme which also intended to boost the river economy through floating jetties uh, along the riparian states between the stretch of haldia and uh, varanasi and we have all, already have this uh, the plenty of ganga cleaning initiatives in uh, starting from 2010 to 2014 the namami gange program and all and uh, as recent as in the draft uh, environmental impact assessment 2020 draft notification that was passed it has its implications in terms of the urban uh, development projects and specifically the b2 categories which entail this uh, uh, the river front 
and the the inland waterways program so uh, because it's important because uh, in terms of the uh, passing of the M environmental impact assessment act they uh, they are exempted from the public consultation and also the environmental clearances which kind of uh, leads to uh, aggravated uh, transformation in these species and we also have this uh, the new visionaries that have been uh, adopted in terms of making the worlding of cities so we have uh, the west bengal chief minister uh, kind of designing the hooghly riverfront development scheme on the lines of thames and england uh, to make uh, kolkata the london of the east these have implications in terms of how the riverfront get reproduced in the recent urban policy discourses and how we kind of have a change in the optics of seeing them from a decaying margin to that of a very potential site for capital intervention and where we kind of see the agent of urban transformation is basically the market and we kind of uh, try to see the valorization of the spaces and adding value in the everyday spaces that used to uh, used to be there so uh, my work kind of lies at the theoretical intersections between the hydro social relations place making and the production of space literature so hydro social relations is uh, kind of it talks about seeing water and social as a co constituting each other and the process of making and remaking each other it kind of stems from the urban political ecological literature so it talks about the unequal power relations that exist within the spaces and also it sees urbanization itself as a very historically rooted socio cultural political project so uh, it kind of talks about this imaginings of past present and the future as well and in terms of the place making literature we have this planning and design interventions to to kind of have investments in terms of labor capital and also the state policies are there to 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 deal with the materiality of the spaces and to create something uh, which in this case actually transforms a nuisance to an asset by adding of the aesthetics and the beauty premium and the production of space literature as lefeb talks about uh, Uh, it kind of deals with the special tribe which is of the conceived perceived and the lived spaces and it also talks about how this mediations create new urban spaces in the city so uh, a quick glance at the past imaginary of the city and how the place making used to happen around the river in calcutta so if you look into the 17th century hooghly river it was basically a port city and uh, we also have the imperial vision of making a very uninterrupted uh, river bank promenade which is which is called the strand road so uh, at that point of time the paradigm was that of property thinking so uh, by the end of the 20th century we have different uh, speculative uh, urban land markets that came up and the fact that there was basically uh, it's a tidal landscape in, in in case of kolkata and it didn't have a separation between the land and the water so there were multiple manipulations and tweakings that were done in the legal and the infrastructure ambits in order to create uh, spaces that are that can be considered as land and to uh, to kind of use the fixity of land as a bankable projects so this kind of nitin sinha talks about as a production of the urban fluvial landscape by the state the state hydraulic paradigm kind of transform the spaces into these uh, habitable spaces so what we see i mean why it's interesting is because we have a very similar trajectory that is going on even now in the post national regimes and this is particularly the era of the neo liberal capital so uh, my study area is basically i i kind of take up ghats four selected site and i take up transits between two ghats as a spaces to study these dynamics the objectives are first to understand the ghats as a lived spaces which embody this everyday hydro social relations and also to unpack the politics of place making at this river fronts and how this transformation actually takes place in this era of new liberal capital so as i said i have taken three sites from the kolkata municipal corporation uh, part and one site uh, which is from the kolkata metropolitan development authority which is a larger greater kolkata uh, which falls within the uh, greater kolkata domain so the first site is basically the transit between nimtola burning ghat and the ayutola burning ghat these are very historically significant because this particular burning ghat is the oldest in calcutta and also ayutola has been historically very significant in terms of the ferrying and uh, uh, all the services and the fact that it has a very uh, like historicity attached to it is because that uh, there are multiple temples that have also come up and basically the space is more of a religious space so every day uh, religious activities kind of go on in this spaces then we also have the transit between chotela and armenian ghat which also houses the uh, the molik ghat flower market which is asia's largest wholesale flower market and uh, then we have the uh, the stretch between the princess ghat and babu ghat this is actually the part of the erstwhile beautified strand road that the british had made and this is also uh, this is actually the beautified part of this otherwise the the, uh, the the ones that i talked about earlier were basically scattered ghats along the the entire route and the last one is not exactly a ghat but it actually had a batanagar ghat but this is a site of the batanagar industrial township 
and also the Patanagar factory. But it was kind of uh, taken over as a, a real estate boom took place after the deindustrialization de took place and the Alcra was passed. And so this is basically interesting because uh, this is a 262 acres uh, land that uh, si sits on this uh, this uh, the, the erstwhile industrial township, and it's a joint stock venture between the Kolkata planning bodies and uh, a kind of corporate body which is called the uh, the United Bellany Credit Bellany Limited. So this Calcutta Riverside project has been uh, the, the entire marketing strategy behind this real estate has been the the riverfront as a as a kind of a very lucrative site for investment and to, uh, to which is something very starting and different from the ghats or the everyday spaces that were there. So this is uh, roughly I kind of did a uh, illustrations about how, what actually is the land use pattern in these areas and what we see as I was talking about the first uh, space is more of a religious space because it has a burning heart that that rituals that go on and also the there are multiple temples there. The second is more of a tread space because it has the uh, the petty treading that goes on every on an everyday basis and it has the the warehouses of the British Times also. And the last one is more of a public space oriented thing because it has a large facade and the precinct is large and it also houses the flower market, which is uh, which I was telling about. It's the largest cut flowers market uh, uh, thing in the in Kolkata. If I kind of quickly go through the uh, the summation of what the relations are to present that at, at, at uh, present in terms of empirically what we see are basically the social relations in terms of how the ghats get used and that also has a, a variation in terms of the spatial patterns the temporal uh, aspects of it and also certain gendered groups accessing only at certain times of the of the day so uh, we also see that the spaces are in flux so there's not exactly uh, that there's a constant group or one group particularly accessing it, but there are rhythms that Lefib talks about and performances that are also uh, quite temporarily specific. So we also have this, uh, as I was talking about, the religious and non-religious activities and also the access and aesthetics kind of differ in terms of each of the everydayness and also the degree of intervention that have been taken place in each of these ghats. So economics, uh, as I was talking about again, the flower market, the crematorium, the goods trading, all of it creates new uh, economic spaces within that uh, area. But the nature of the work that uh, this margin, uh, the city water margin kind of entails is that of very casual and very contractual labor. So there's a precarity of work and also the living conditions that, that kind of uh, characterizes spaces. And the flow of communities are actually something that comes from the other margins of the cities to the core, because this, these are located quite centrally to the city. The political uh, aspect of it is basically that the, in terms of governance, there are multiplicity of in institutions that kind of govern the spaces. So which are both formal, informal, and they kind of provide infrastructural provisions on a formal and informal basis. There are rules and regulations and planning protocols, which get further negotiated by the people who are living in the spaces. And therefore, it leads to more conflicts related to occupancy and uh, eviction. So the ultimate thing that kind of boils down is basically the land question, because ultimately it's, it's actually the separation between land and water, which was also the paradigm of the British times that kind of plays into uh, the action even right now. So these contestations are actually over the land that kind of borders this riverfront spaces. And uh, there are uh, lucrative uh, investments, opportunities that are being pushed uh, very much by the urban policies in recent times. So. Uh, quickly uh, rushing through the uh, the pictures that kind of uh, will give you the visuals of how the space looks like. So these are the physical spaces. And as, as I was talking about, all of this have the this British architectural features, and therefore they have large uh, facades and precincts to kind of uh, enable more public activity to go on. We also have the ritual and, rituals and performances, like uh, everyday basis, we have the washing and then leisure activities and also other uh, activities that go on on a daily basis. Uh, the religious act practices are interesting because this, as I was saying, it has a like Hindu uh, uh, in, in terms of Hindu faith, the river is kind of considered very holy and therefore uh, the, the kind of blossoming of so many temples and all these religious activities. We also have this informal economy that thrives very well in this marginal spaces. So that these are the spaces that have been regarded by the city as a spaces of discard. So everything that is not needed to the core of the city in, in terms of the manicured spaces are act actually being pushed into this borders of the of the city. So uh, again, this, uh, this is basically the petty trading and also the flower market that I was talking about. And also it's interesting space for the laborers or the migrants that actually work in these spaces because these are also the, uh, the spaces that provide them the leisure and also the to kind of rest and uh, in between the labor work. So uh, uh, lastly, the aesthetic makeover the spaces that have taken place in the recent times, which uh, like, for example, the memorials have been built and also the Strand Road has been beautified as a part of this uh, riverfront beautification scheme. 
So the idea is that uh, these are spaces that embody these relationships, but there are also contestations around the spaces, which are basically the claims over land and also the multiplicity of agencies that are into play. For example, the, there's a Kolkata Port Trust. There's also the private agencies who are in uh, like the duty of uh, maintaining all the spaces. Then there are the people who are also, who don't actually have rights uh, over the city, but actually they settle down in the quarters and the settlements. And also the railways that kind of completely uh, run through this uh, spaces. So the ultimate uh, like tussle of the imaginaries is basically how do we project the spaces, whether it's a frontier to the city or a backyard to the city, because the Calcutta Riverside project kind of markets it as a, as a very lucrative opportunity uh, as a frontier to the city. Whereas if you see in reality, there are basically nalas draining down into the river and also which, uh, spaces which are kind of used as dump yards to the city. So basically, the tussle uh, belongs to the everyday spaces versus those beautification attempts. So this is second, uh, the the kind of holding that kind of talk, uh, talks about the uh, basically beautification attempts of the of the entire stretch. So the urban context here becomes very important because if we kind of see south as a metaphor to the to the global urbanism part of it, so we see ghats as margins within those margins, and therefore it's interesting to study this informality and the beyond the plan spaces that are there because these are the spaces that bring out the more contested uh, contestations and the negotiations on an everyday basis. We also have Roy and what Roy and Ong talks about the the wording practices because that are uh, that are currently the paradigm because it kind of uh, creates new city identities and images that Lynch also talks about. So the idea is basically this contradictions and tensions that are there in the everyday spaces get uh, even more worse when speculative capital uh, kind of deals with it. And in order to, uh, to kind of uh, like project cities as very uh, like uh, uh, kind of lucrative for investments, we also have this uh, cost of beautification, like who should be visible and who should not be visible. So this economic policies that are there, which I started off with my slides. So these kind of determine also the urban policies that are at play at, on ground. And this kind of understanding is important because it kind of challenges what we, what we kind of, how we see the riverfronts in the present context. And this, the entire idea is to kind of uh, challenge this contemporary understanding and to create uh, spaces that are more dynamic, that are more vibrant, and that kind of deal with are sensitive to the everyday relationships that exist within the spaces. So that's how I kind of end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Uh, yeah. We'll wait for the questions to come up in my chat box. Meanwhile, I thought uh, it was quite interesting what you mentioned about um, Riverfront as a lucrative investment, because you know we've yeah. seen this idea of Riverfront also travel across multiple states and multiple rivers, yeah. you know, perhaps starting with you know Ahmedabad and what we've seen in the case of the Sabarmati and so on. So, uh, in the relation, in relation to you know the ideas around or rather imaginations about environment and so on, uh, I was wondering you know what your thoughts on because it seems to signify a sort of um, aspirational uh, yeah. relationship between you know water and various types of uh, establishments in the city and and the and the city itself. And in some senses, it intersects neatly with the whole land value capture as a means yeah. of financing all sorts of urban interventions these yeah. days. Yeah. And it, it, the riverfront, in a way, falls at the kind of intersection of both of these uh, overall yeah. ideas. I think. Any, yeah. any thoughts on that? While we wait for some questions. So I mean, I think it has. I mean, it ha it was always there because uh, since the British times, it's a Calcutta is a uh, the colonial city, so it has been there for a long time. That to kind of uh, like use the space, which is the city water margin, as a, as a kind of space to to uh, to kind of boost the touristic uh, aspirations of the city and everything. But right now, what is happening in particular is that the in kind of a bid to make cities more, uh, you know, like the worlding practice of it. So kind of the practice of making, for example, Kolkata, the London of the East, or to have those London eye. And similar to a London eye, we have a Kolkata eye, which is still in the like stalled project. But anyway, so this kind of aspirations kind of uh, at pushing the real estate uh, like conchos kind of towards this the marginal spaces because if we kind of develop these spaces it's it's a very the land value goes up to like i mean it's a uh, the boom that takes place so in that sense i think the the practice right now is that of which is quite different from the earlier times but however there is a history to it and therefore th that's that's how i think it's important to look into the past as well as the present uh, dynamics of it Thank you. Um, yeah. Any any other questions, comments from other panelists? 
Uh, thank you all. You know, it's been, you know, I think a great set of uh, papers and they all in many ways connect with each other and the overall idea of, you know, narratives, uh, I mean, uh, on the environment and urban imaginaries. Uh, I think we are out of time now and we'll have to close. Uh, the next panel will be at uh, 1240 and uh, hope to see many of you for that one. Uh, I'll conclude now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.